All this is Dr. Mobeen Sayyid from drmobeen.com. Welcome to one more show. So the discussion today, this is a very interesting study. It is about aspirin's use in moderate patients. That is, patients who arrive at the hospital and use of the aspirin on the very first day is actually associated with reduced mortality and the data is significant and reduced pulmonary embolism and data is significant. And the most important thing is to keep in mind, this study and the benefit was realized on 60 plus. Anyone who was younger than 60, aspirin actually did not make a lot of uh, difference for them. Similarly, anyone who did not have comorbidities, aspirin's effect was less for them. So people 60 plus and with one or more comorbidities, they benefited a lot with aspirin starting from the very first day of they going to the hospital. That is a discussion. Let's look at it. <clears throat> so quick references. This is drbean.com. In the description, there is a link that gives you drbean.com almost for free. This is the study. March 24, 2022, we are in April 11. I have been planning to do this for some time. So here we are. The study is in JAMA, printed, published, I believe accepted. Then here are some more links that are in the description about the functions of aspirin. Aspirin has a tons of things to discuss, but I am going to touch upon a couple of functions that are important for, for the discussion. This is another study. This is from 2004, so old study, aspirin triggers anti-inflammatory um, enzymes. This is another enzyme called lipoxin or LX. We'll talk about that too. And then this is another study, 2019, older study, but aspirin use is associated with decreased mechanical ventilation, intensive care unit admission, and in hospital, <laughs> excuse me, Mortality in hospitalized patients with coronavirus disease. This is 2019. So with these references, here is the study's PDF as well. I have gone over this. Let's look at it from my um, drawings. So here we are. Gifts for humanity. I hope that today my picture is not going to overlap on this. This is a different drawing system that I use with OBS. So I hope it would work. <coughs> and my apologies for the cough. Okay, so the first thing, the key points of the study. Question is, the question that researchers had was, is early aspirin use? And for them, the early met right at the beginning of the hospitalization. To me, it means it should actually be used even earlier. But of course, not everyone can use this because of the bleeding risk. So talk with your doctor. Is early aspirin use in hospitalized patients with moderate COVID-19 associated with lower odds of in-hospital mortality? That was a question. Finding <clears throat> in a cohort study of 112,269 patients, with moderate COVID-19, moderate, early aspirin use during the first day, right from the first day of hospitalization was associated with lower 28-day in-hospital mortality and pulmonary embolism incidence when compared with patients who did not receive early aspirin. This is very important. Meaning, this study suggests that early aspirin use may be associated with lower odds in hospital mortality. So we've done this discussion. And then the authors say that there should be more studies, larger studies to figure this out. Now, very quickly, <clears throat> the platelets are responsible. Platelets are responsible for the clotting in our blood and when there is an injury. Platelets are usually just running around, flying, zipping through the blood in a resting state. And when they are in a resting state, they look very slippery, they look very plates-like, and they do not really tangle with each other. 
However, when they become activated, and there are many ways that the platelet becomes activated. We have done those discussions. So at this time, just know that platelets come across some event that triggers them to clot. They know that we need to now make a plug and we need to take care of this clot. So when, <coughs> excuse me, when they become ready for clotting, they develop little spikes or they developed little pseudopods, you can say, extensions. Those extensions start entangling with each other, plus they get start wrapping with the tissue as well. So this is all the mechanism to put them together. Then we put fibrin around them and we tie them together in a big clot and that becomes a clot. Now here, aspirin has two primary functions. So first we figured out that what platelet do now <coughs> excuse me now the aspirin aspirin has two important functions to keep in mind during the study one is the antithrombotic effect antithrombotic effect is that if you look at this study this picture here and let me get my marker so here this is these are platelets in the wall in the cell membrane of the platelets there are enzymes called cyclooxygenase 1 and cyclooxygenase 2. I have done a separate complete discussion about aspirin and the mechanism of action. So for us today, this is sufficient that in the cell membrane of the platelet, there are enzymes called COX-1 and COX-2. The COX-1 or cyclooxygenase 1 is responsible to make eventually thromboxin A2. When the platelet becomes activated, when it says, all right, I need to make a clot, it starts the COX-1 activity and that finally results in thromboxin A2. There are many other molecules as well, but for us, thromboxin A2 is important. Thromboxin A2 in turn is a very potent vasoconstrictor. Remember that wherever we'll get an injury, we would like to reduce the blood flow to that area so that there is not a lot of bleeding. The person doesn't die of bleeding. And you can see that people do die of bleeding. So this is not always a successful phenomena. But generally, in common day-to-day -day injuries, this works very well. Plus, the injuries that are happening within our body, it works very well to kind of provide first aid. So vasoconstriction occurs. And then platelet activation occurs. So when thromboxin A2, when one platelet becomes active, it helps activate other platelets. Cool. Now, here is this little guy that is aspirin. Aspirin's role is that it blocks cyclooxygenase 1 directly. It deactivates this enzyme. So when the cyclooxygenase is deactivated, this platelet is now useless. Why? Because it cannot participate in vasoconstriction activities and it cannot help to activate other platelets. It's really useless now. So then you can ask this question that how would we have clotting? Let's say there is a legitimate reason for clotting. Let's say there is an injury and there is bleeding. So usually not all platelets are deactivated. One. Secondly, we make new platelets all the time. That is why you have to keep taking aspirin. One dose is not sufficient. But once a platelet is deactivated, it is usually just useless now. We will have to make new platelets to take their place. The second mechanism is the cyclooxygenase. This cyclooxygenase enzyme, these two little enzymes here, they're usually found in a pair, cyclooxygenase 1 and 2, sitting together on the cell membranes. Now, this diagram is of the blood vessels. So let's say this is the interior of a blood vessel. This is an endothelial cell. That is a cell that is facing the blood side. So in this endothelial cell, we have cyclooxygenase as well. And cyclooxygenases are present in almost all cells. But these are the important areas where we are focusing. Now here, aspirin also works. This is the 
endothelial cell. This is the cell that is facing the blood side. Aspirin work on the endothelial cells as well and on the cyclooxygenase, but it does not really just deactivate this one. It actually changes its behavior. It goes to the cyclooxygenase 2 or COX-2. It puts this little acetyl group on it, where it causes acetylation of the cyclooxygenase enzyme. And what happens is, now that enzyme behaves differently. It is still functioning. Remember, aspirin had actually stopped cyclooxygenase 1, deactivated it. But cyclooxygenase 2 is still functioning. However, the function actually becomes very interesting. It goes to become anti-inflammatory or reduced inflammatory or resolution of inflammation is where this platelet is now going to help. So how does that work? What happens is this is cyclooxygenase enzyme. This is aspirin here. Aspirin would acetylate the cyclooxygenase enzyme that causes cyclooxygenase enzyme to produce more enzymes that will then leak out from this endothelium. <coughs> Excuse me. Now, if you can please look at my hands for a second, because this leak out is a very interesting phenomena. So it is not that really the, the enzymes that will be formed, the molecules that are formed are released from the platelet. Instead, this is the, so I should not say platelet, we're talking about endothelial cell. So imagine this is the endothelial cell. It is facing, this cell is facing the blood. So blood cells are just passing, correct? So when a, an immune cell comes in contact with the endothelium, they interact, they talk. This is called transcellular metabolism, they can talk with each other and participate in making enzymes together, making molecules together, like some people make babies together. So here is an endothelial cell in which the aspirin arrived, it changed the cyclooxygenase pathway and cyclooxygenase made an enzyme, a molecule that then when a neutrophil come in contact, that went into the neutrophil. They both, endothelium and neutrophil, have to come in contact to kind of do this whole thing together. So once, so what is that molecule that is sent over there? The molecule is called, my apologies, <laughs> this um, enzyme, this molecule inside the endothelium is called 15-R-H-A-T-E. This molecule transfers into the neutrophil. Neutrophil in turn has an enzyme called 5-lipooxygenase. 5-lipooxygenase works on 15-R-H-A-T-E and produces further enzymes. One of those is called ATL or aspirin triggered lipooxygenase. Its name is 15 epi lipoxin A4, <laughs> but for us ATL is sufficient. It is aspirin triggered lipooxygenase. It's an enzyme. And then there is lipooxygenase A4 separately present as well. The function of both of these is to reduce inflammation. So what do what do they do? They try to they connect with various cells and they deactivate their inflammatory behaviors. Plus, they are pro-resolution. Pro-resolution means that they favor those markers to be released from the cells that would allow the immune and inflammation to reduce and finish, resolve. Not immune system, but the inflammation to resolve. So all of a sudden. Aspirin has converted this platelet. On one end, it has deactivated cyclooxygen is one. On the other end, it has converted it into a helpful little cell. Now, what is the help? Inflammation is reduced. Do you know that this is the only function that is triggered by 
non-steroidal anti-inflammatory aspirin. No other non-steroidal anti-inflammatory can do this. So others would just try to block the inflammation. This not only blocks the inflammation, aspirin, but it actually promotes the resolution of inflammation by working on cyclooxygenase 2. There is no other medicine that does it, meaning no other NSAID that does it. Okay, so this is the general idea of how aspirin works. Now the study itself. So study is an observational study. It used, I think, data from 64 hospitals in NIH uh, circle. There were 112,269 patients. They were all hospitalized. They were all moderate patients. The median age was 63. And I believe it was somewhere from 40 and onwards. The primary outcome that they wanted was to see what would happen in 28 days in terms of mortality for the patient. Will patient die in 28 days who are taking this medicine versus not? The secondary outcome they wanted to see was pulmonary embolism, if that will be less or not compared to placebo or those who did not get the aspirin, or the deep vein thrombosis, and will the people get that too or not? Now, there was another thing, and that was bleeding disorders, cerebral hemorrhages or other bleeding disorders, GIT bleeding. So they were observing those as well as side effects to see will we see more of these side effects compared to those patients who are not getting aspirin? Now, keep in mind that this study does not say that they had to look at clotting to see if the patient had clotting going and then only give aspirin. They just started them on aspirin the very first day. So the treatment plan was 81 milligram per day and if you look at the interquartile, that is 81 to 81 as well. So that means all uh, variations were 81 milligrams. So it was just 81 milligram per day was aspirin given. It's, it's not a lot of dose. The duration of administering aspirin was five days median. However, two to 10 days was interquartile. So that means some hospitals and some doctors were giving it for two days, some for 10 days, some for five days or six days. Anyways, median were five, was five days. So 80 milligram per day for five days is kind of the protocol you saw here. So what did they see? What was the outcome? The outcome was this. <coughs> Patients in the aspirin group had higher rates of chronic kidney disease. So check this out. This is the patient's difference. More chronic disease patients on the aspirin side, 39.4% on aspirin versus 17.3% in non-aspirin. Chronic obstructive pulmonary diseases were also more on the aspirin side, 17.6% versus 10.3%. Heart diseases were more on the aspirin side, of course, those patients take aspirins. 55.3% versus 21.1%. Hypertension, 75.6% versus 43.9%. Diabetes, 51.1% versus 27.2%. The point is, before the weighted balance, the aspirin cohort had more comorbidities on its side. In addition, more patients in the aspirin group had a history of prior aspirin use than patients in the non-aspirin group. So 46% versus 42%. So this was the basic design. The results. 28 day in hospital mortality. Overall, considering everyone, 10.2% mortality versus 11.8% mortality. So that is about 15% improvement. <clears throat> Odds ratio was 0.85. So 0.85% was similar. 
and 15% were different and the favor was towards aspirin. 95% confidence interval was from 0.79 to 0.92. So 8% to 20% improvement. P-value is significant as well. So this is significant data. That means aspirin does it. So for every 100 patients, 15 are likely to, to be benefited by aspirin use on the very first day for five days. And it's not even a lot of use, 81 milligram per kilogram, oh, sorry, not per kilogram per day. Now pulmonary embolism, 1.0% versus 1.4% in non-aspirin. So that is 29% improvement or odds ratio of 0 0.71. 95% confidence interval, 0 0.5, 0 0.36 to 0 0.9. This is 0 0.56. So again, it does not cross unity. It is significant. P-value 0 0.004. That is also significant. <laughs> the only outcome that was not significant was deep vein thrombosis. That was similar in both groups. So they have a a number of hypotheses for why that happened, but that is one area where the difference was not seen or the benefit was not seen. Now, subgroup analysis, this is the fun part of the study. Subgroup, 60 years of age and over benefited from this. Authors kind of said it in one sentence that below 60 did not benefit from it. I think that is an important call out to make for everyone to say below 60 and without comorbidities, the benefit was very less. Now, what was the benefit for more than 60? 61 to 80 years, odds ratio 0 0.79. That means about 21% benefit. That's a lot of benefit. And the confidence interval is 0 0.72 to 0 0.87, that is 13% to 28% benefit, 60 to 81, or 80, 61 to 80. P-value is significant as well. Greater than 80, 0 0.79, but look at the confidence interval, 0 0.69 to 0 0.91, that means about 9% to 31% benefit or odds ratio of 0 0.79, 21% overall range is this. P-value is significant as well. So as the age increases, the benefit of aspirin increases for mortality. That's a big deal. Then further subgroup analysis. One comorbidity, so for example, diabetes or hypertension or cardiovascular disease or renal disease and so on. One comorbidity, 6.4% improvement versus 9.2% in non-aspirin. Odds ratio of 0 0.68, 0 0.68. That means 32% likely benefit from mortality, likely reduced mortality, 32%. And 95% confidence interval, 0 0.55 to 0 0.83. That means, so 0 0.83 will mean 17% and 0 0.55 mean 45. So from 17% to 45% benefit, reduction in mortality. We are, we're talking about this little measly aspirin taken from the very first day of the hospitalization for from anywhere where from two to 10 days, but median five days, 81 milligram. And p-value is significant. Here. Now two comorbidities, 10.5% 10 versus 12.8% was the benefit 
or I should say reduced mortality. Odds ratio 0 0.8, 0 which is 20% reduction. 95% confidence interval, 0 0.69 to 0 0.93. So 0 0.93 is 7% and 0 0.69 is 31. So 7 to 31% reduction. P value is also good. Can you can you see how interesting these numbers are? We're just talking about aspirin. It blows my mind. I keep repeating it. Three comorbidities. 13.8% versus 17.0%. Odds ratio 0 0.78, which will mean 22% reduction, associated reduction. So 95% confidence interval. 0 0.68 to 0 0.89, which will mean 11% to 32% reduction in mortality in 28 days if the patient was given aspirin for the first few days. P value is significant. More than three comorbidities 17% versus 21.6%. Odds ratio 0 0.74, that means 26% likely reduction. Confidence interval is from 0 0.66 to 0 0.84. So that would mean 16% to 44% or 34, 34%. 16% to 34% reduction is associated, reduction in mortality associated with aspirin use on the first few days. P-value, zero point, also significant, 0 0.001. <coughs> Excuse me. So subgroup analysis. And if you just give me one quick second, I want to break my fast. Apologies. Okay, so the association between early aspirin and decreased mortality was greater in patients older than 60. We saw that. But look at these highlighted parts. Patients receiving early aspirin between age between ages 18 and 40 years and 41 and 60 years did not have lower odds of mortality. So really, 18 to 60 did not benefit from this. And this is what we just went over. Secondly, in patients without comorbidities, there was no association between early aspirin and mortality. And the data is here. 0.99% odds ratio. 0 0.99 <coughs> means really 1% possible reduction and then if you look at the confidence interval it crosses unity so it is not significant p value is also not significant so younger patients younger than 60 no benefit patients regard <coughs> regardless of their age no comorbidities comor no benefit this cough is bothering me today, so my apologies. So, complications. GIT hemorrhage, that was a fear. Ulcers and stomach ulcers and GIT hemorrhages can happen with aspirin. So, 0.8% versus 0.7%. Odds ratio is 1.04, so slightly upticked on the aspirin side. 0 0.04. Then if you look at the confidence interval, that crosses unity, so not significant. P crosses, P is more than 0 0.05, so that is also not significant. Meaning, between the two groups, there was no significant difference, which is a good thing here. Meaning, this amount of, this dose of aspirin and duration of aspirin did not create the risk of GIT bleeding. Similarly, cerebral hemorrhage, 
folks for bleeding in the brain 0.6 percent versus 0.4 percent odds ratio 1.32 so tilts towards aspirin however the data was not significant confidence interval cross unity p is 0.13 so it tilted towards possibility with aspirin of cerebral hemorrhage but insignificant data blood transfusion needed for example if the clotting becomes too disturbed and now the the platelets are just not functioning at all and you have to give transfusions so 2.7 percent versus 2.3 percent odds ratio 0 1.14 confidence interval crosses unity p is also kind of not significant almost significant so complications were really not significant the composite of hemorrhagic complications meaning all of them together did not occur more often in those receiving aspirin and that is 3.7 percent aspirin versus 3.2 percent not aspirin odds ratio 1.13 1 to 1.25 0 0.54 so almost significant but not much difference so that is the study <laughs> i i saw Saraswati talking about the lozenge. So I'll do it. I, I was trying that I don't take something during the fast, but I'll have to. <laughs> there, are, there are so many. Try to see next. My problem is that during the, although during the fast, it is allowed to take medicine. If you're a patient, I just was stubborn enough to not take medicines. Yeah, so allergies are just uh, too much. I went out for a for an hour or so. Luffy was outside, and so I went in the backyard as well. And I just have been coughing since then. It was very windy today as well. So, thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> I, I will take the medicine. So, so is Doctor been sick in this from his January COVID or allergies? So I think my COVID. And then cough with COVID just got wrapped and lumped into the allergies as well. So now I'm just coughing. I, I actually did this silly thing of going out with Luffy. And then, and I stood out for one hour. Actually, Ma <laughs> Margaret knows I was calling Margaret as well during that time. So yes, of course, I'm dehydrated as well. Okay, so should we break for today as I'm <laughs> allergic to COVID? Kind of, yes. So Samina, Dr. Samina says, at what time your iftari starts? So it started at 7.40, so about 15 minutes ago. Synthesis, yes. <clears throat> so why not we do this? So I was reading some comments. So let me do the closing comments. And maybe we skip the chit chat today because I'm having difficulty speaking. Um, please <laughs> like, subscribe, and share. There are links in the description if you would like to get access to Dr. Bean or want to support this work. Thank you very much, and I would see you tomorrow. Bye-bye for now.